I like to go out on my boat for just the sheer pleasure. There is nothing like the elegant waves of the sea and sounds of nothing but mother nature all around you. Until you get seasick that is. Then it kinda sucks. I'm not a fisherman, marine biologist, or any sorts of explorer. Heck, I'm definitely not going to be that last one after what happened to me the most recent time I was out on the waters. For some background, I'm a lottery winner. One of the ones who wasn't dumb enough to blow their money within the first six months of having it. Not saying that I'm some sort of finance obsessed freak, but I do like to enjoy my wealth. But I just don't want to go overboard and buy a mansion right off the bat. I obviously won't be giving out details of who I am or any particular information about where I live. But as a code name, you may call me David. Something simple and right to the point. I will also be redacting and subtracting names of places, as well as giving code names to other people involved. I was out one day, cruising along the waves on my admittedly small motorboat. A smile on my face, a case of beer in the cockpit, and nothing but pure and utter joy running through my veins. It seemed like life couldn't be any better. And in all honesty, it really couldn't. At one point, I switched off the motor and simply let the boat float along. God, was that a mistake. I peered over the side, glancing down at all the marine life below me, all sorts of fish and crustaceans. I was even sure I could see what looked to be a coral reef towards the ocean floor. It was a pleasant sight on the eyes. I'm a person who finds fun in simple things like this. Too many cynics exist in the world. And many people would add the phrase, these days after that sentence. But people like that have existed since the dawn of time. It's nothing new. I just don't see the point of making a big fuss about things that are insignificant in the grand scheme of enjoyment and simple pleasure. It's like those people who try to apply real life logic to sci-fi or horror movies. They know who they are. The ones who whine about stuff like characters calling a magazine a club are not calling the police when they're in the middle of running from a 10 foot tall demon creature that can bend reality. But I'm rambling. The point is, I'm a pretty simple-minded guy, and that's okay. There's nothing wrong with taking life as it comes and wanting to enjoy the basic pleasures without analyzing every single detail. Anyway, there I was, sitting in towards the rear of the boat with my feet up and a beer in my hand, drinking and watching the ocean do its thing. And let me tell you, it did its thing alright. It took me a minute to notice, due to the fact that I was a tiny bit buzzed. But the sky began to become overcast. Slowly but surely, I was engulfed in the dim light of the storm clouds forming above. Soon enough, the waves had started to pick up, getting a little bit more powerful each time I felt them pass underneath the boat. Rocking it violently as the boat continued to sit on the surface. I got up. Figuring it was probably a good time to probably head back to shore, and by extension, safety. I returned to the cockpit, sat down and attempted to turn the engine on to get it going. The boat moved and everything seemed to be completely fine. But the waves, the waves were starting to approach a more dangerous state, even threatening to completely flip my boat over. I did my best to navigate through the rough conditions. Although, going too fast would result in only making it worse. But it's hard to have restraints when you feel like your own life may be on the line. Nonetheless, I tried to stay calm and rational. I wanted to make it out of this unscathed. If I'm being totally honest, the fear of being stranded in the middle of the sea terrifies me far more than death ever could. Water splashed itself inside the cockpit. My clothes were drenched within seconds. Not too long after that, I was starting to cough up water. I still tried to push on, desperate to make it back to shore. But the ocean didn't seem to want to let me leave. It kept me where I was, thrashing my boat back and forth and letting me know I definitely wasn't the one in control. 
Far from it. What was once the fresh-smelling, colorful, and enchanting view of the aquatic habitat was now transforming into a watery hell. The sky above me had now become almost completely darkened by these storm clouds, giving the sea below a much more unsettling appearance. Eventually, it came to a point where I had realized that I wasn't going to be able to maneuver my way out of here on my own. I looked around with panic spread across my face, reaching into my pocket and trying to grab my phone to call for help. I frantically attempted to retrieve my phone, only to find that it wasn't in my pocket. I had seemingly forgotten it back home, a mistake that I made all too often, and one that was now going to cost me dearly. I cursed and swore obnoxiously at the revelation, feeling that I had just foolishly sealed my own fate. As if it couldn't get any worse, the waves became stronger. Soon, I myself was hanging on for dear life on the boat as I tried not to fall off the sides and back. I was repeatedly thrown around like a ragdoll, as if I only weighed a few pounds instead of 200. Eventually, I was jerked forward by the force of a wave colliding with the boat. I unconsciously took a wrong step, fell forward, and slammed my head onto one of the benches inside the boat, causing me to black out. I have no idea how or what transpired in the time that I was out cold, but when I had awoken, I was still in the boat, still on the ocean. Except this time, the sea had returned to its more soothing and relaxed state, as it had been previously before the storm. The sun, now out once again and brighter than ever. Without any device to tell the time or location, not that I was sure that it would work that well out here anyway, I was at a loss for how much daylight I may have had left. I was still laying on the floor of the boat. My head was horrendously aching and I felt slightly dizzy. I was sure that I had ended up getting a slight concussion from the hit. It took me a few minutes of struggling and grunting to get back to my feet. When I glanced forward, I was met with the sight of what looked to be an aquatic cave opening in front of me. It was attached to a small, rocky, and rough little island terrain. Definitely not something that you could live on. Not without getting constantly impaled anyway. I was puzzled as to where I had ended up. This didn't look like anything I had seen before in my usual area. I spun around, attempting to spot some other landmass or place to park the boat and get out. But only the open ocean stared back at me. Everything from my heart to my bones told me not to go into the cave. I tried to fire up the motor and drive out into the sea, wanting to not even give myself the chance to change my mind. But the motor was completely fried. The paddle that I had brought along in case of such an instance taking place was also gone, probably floating along the surface somewhere dozens of miles away. And, like a moron, I hadn't brought any food besides the beer. Not that you could really call that food to begin with. Although it didn't matter much, because the beer that I had yet to drink was also gone, lost to the vast emptiness of the sea. Now, the cave seemed like the only option. Or maybe I was just panicking too much. As I said, I try not to stress about things. It's unhealthy and unproductive. But this, this is an entirely different ballgame. The heat from the sun was beginning to get to me. I know that it wouldn't be long before I obtained a nasty sunburn. Not to mention the fact that the brightness of the light was only increasing my current dizziness. I reached over the side of the boat and shoved about half my forearm through the surface of the water. The moisture was unnaturally relieving on my arm. I was even tempted to scoop up some of the liquid and take a gulp. But seeing as it was salt water, that would only make things worse. I waved my arm in a stroking manner through the water, using it as a makeshift paddle to edge myself closer toward the entrance of the cave. As I got closer and the light assisted my vision, I could see the inside was far bigger than what I had originally assumed. A fluorescent glow seeped its way from the waves below, like a natural aquatic lamp. 
I was no expert on marine life, so I had no idea what caused it, but it was absolutely breathtaking. A gorgeous light red and pink hue that lit the inside more than well enough for me to see. I kept stroking my way forward, switching arms in the process as the original was stinging from the buildup of muscle fatigue. The geometry of the cave became more and more open. The expansiveness of the cave was far beyond what the entrance made look possible. The light protruding from the water now began to shift to a lighter blue instead of a previous red, illuminating the rocky walls and small vermin living between these stones hanging from the ceiling. And then I spotted a large object floating in the water further down the cave. It put my boat to shame in just mass alone. I strained my neck to look up and get a full view of what I was seeing. There, right in front of me, sat a ship. An old wooden abandoned ship. A black flag in the front and back as the sails with a skull and crossbones in the middle. It was a pretty stereotypical pirate ship, but still a sight to behold nonetheless. Most of these sails themselves had begun to wear, along with the wood being rotted in many spots, especially towards the bottom. I was amazed. The panic and hesitance I felt previously had subsided. It was clearly old and had been in here for quite a while, leaning slightly to the right of the cave, a hole on its side that allowed a small pool of water to rest in the bottom deck. I fought past the fatigue and paddled myself closer, with both arms this time, eager to find what might be waiting for me in the large relic. I'll admit as I got closer, and the light coming from underwater became less potent, the ship definitely revealed itself to have a more haunting appearance. But for some reason, I simply didn't care. What if I found treasure? Stuff to make me even richer than I already was. What once felt like a nightmare gone wrong was now an exhilarating adventure. I finally made it to the hole in the bottom of the ship, stopped my paddling and I stood up in the boat. It rocked slightly due to the change in weight placement. I leaned in as far as I could without stepping off the boat, trying to get a peek into the interior, or what was left of it at least. The vast majority of it was empty, an array of spider webs covering the interior. A frown crept onto my face, being disappointed that I had seemingly found nothing of value. However, when I glanced toward the right and I squinted my eyes, I could just about make out the shine of what looked to be a small piece of metal. I leaned forward slightly further, nearly tripping and face planting in the process. It was a dark wooden chest. The piece of metal was what I assumed to be the lock. I turned and checked behind me, just to make sure that I was completely alone. That's when I laid eyes upon an unsettling but simultaneously interesting sight. It was a skeleton laying on a patch of rock next to the boat. A real skeleton. Cobwebs between its teeth and no life in its eyes. There wasn't a single patch of skin left on the bones. But on the top of its head sat a pirate hat. Next to its bony hand was a sword laid out on the rock formation. In the small chance that I did encounter something dangerous in there, I decided it was worth grabbing the sword. I maneuvered over the rock formation, bent down and picked the large blade up. It gleamed in the dim lighting of this section of the cave. I jumped back into the boat, and then crouched down and I stepped into the ship, once again checking my surroundings. Jesus, I blurted seeing that I had underestimated just how thick these spiderwebs were. But now that I was closer, I could see this structure seemed to be infested with arachnids. I raised the lengthy blade and began to swing frantically, cutting through as many of the webs as I could, although it was more taxing than what I had originally predicted due to my arm already being heavily exerted from the paddling. I was spitting up some of the webs and rubbing them out of my eyes. A large amount clumped itself into my hair, which I didn't even want to begin to deal with. 
I was just a feet away from the chest, the metal lock shining even brighter than before. It was truly a sight to behold. I see you've taken an interest in my goodies. I jumped when I heard the voice from behind, gripping the sword tightly as I nearly yelped like a small animal. It was soft yet deep, something you would expect from a grandfather. I hesitantly turned around, making sure to keep the sword grasped firmly as I was about to lock eyes with the source of the voice. Immediately I froze, more out of confusion than fear, because there was no source, no body, no demon or ghoul, nothing. It was disembodied, or so I thought. Over here, you fool, it bellowed, now becoming clearly impatient in its tone. I looked over to the hull of the ship where I had originally entered. Past that, I still saw the skeleton laying on the rock, the skeleton in which I took the sword from. You came for my treasure, yes? Is that what you want? Even more riches than you already have? You are quite the greedy man, that much is clear. The jaw and or mouth of the skeleton didn't move his mouth as he spoke. In fact, he didn't move at all. But now that I was made aware of it, I could trace the voice coming right from the spot that he was laying. How, how do you know about my money? I stuttered, attempting to feign confidence and mask my unease. The skeleton simply laughed. Not an obnoxious, evil, mustache-twirling villain laugh that you would expect but rather that of someone in a comedy club who had just been told a decent joke. For a man who loves the fantastical, you seem quite ignorant when you finally encounter it. You hear me, a dead man, speaking without movement of my lips or possession of my flesh, yet you question how I know of your material prosperity. No, that's not possible, I shot back. Fine, continue to live in ignorance. But I can get you access to the riches inside that chest that you've been eyeing. I know you desire it more than anything. I think I'm perfectly capable of opening it myself, I replied, turning and raising the sword to slice the integrity of the lock. I pulled back with all my might and I came down on the chest. The sword had simply been split into two. The remaining half that hadn't fallen off was smoking as if it had just been shoved inside a pit of hot coals. The chest was undamaged. A wave of relief came over me knowing that I was at least smart enough to have not touched it with my bare hands. The skeleton cackled, this time in a much more taunting manner, as if to make fun of me and laugh at my futile attempt to get the chest open. Well, as you see, you don't have the means to get what you want. Only I can help you, which is why you should accept my proposal. Think bigger than what you've seen and heard. Open yourself to new possibility. I whipped around to stare back at the unmoving pile of bones once more, frustration and malice now overtaking my fear. If you're so smart, then you do it. You're nothing but a decayed corpse. I have no reason to be scared in the first place. I erupted dropping the last half of the sword as punctuated by my tirade. Suddenly, I was thrown against a wall opposite the chest by an unseen forest. My body couldn't move forward or fight against it, no matter how hard I tried. I was stuck there, pinned against the wall via supernatural means. You are amusing, but I would advise you not to overstep your boundaries. I am no benevolent figure. If you continue to vex me, I will kill you, understood? The forest only increased against my body, threatening to crush my bones and flatten me like a human pancake. Is that understood? The skeleton asked again, this time much more apathetically, saying and knowing he was already aware of my response. Yes, I coughed, now beginning to have my airflow restricted. Finally, the strange entity released me. I quickly fell to the ground, slightly scraping my hands and knees on the wood. I coughed a few more times, running my hands along my throat to feel any damage. 
Now that you remember where you stand, I'll ask you one last time. Do you want me to give you access to the treasure that you seek? As long as you pay my price. What's the price? I asked, raising myself back up on two legs, stumbling back as I fought to keep my balance. Well, the price is that I can't tell you what your consequences are. They will appear, that is for sure, but nothing I do will affect you directly, depending on your perspective. It all weighs on your decisions and choices. I would be cautious of how you go about your affairs. Why would I make a deal when you're being so vague about the terms? What, do you want my soul or something? The skeleton chuckled absently. No. And because the moment you saw that chest you knew that next to nothing would stop you from getting what's inside. Until I did. You are no criminal mastermind. No cruel dictator. Or evil ruler. But you are no saint either. Your values are not that of the spiritual. Both you and I know that full well. If all of your financial troubles have already disappeared long ago, imagine what you can do with this. And seeing as you are a man of material, that appeals to you as a fresh corpse appeals to a scavenger. As hard as it is to admit it, he's right. I like money, my boat, as much as I come out onto the ocean and enjoy the view of the water and the simple beauty of nature. Items of monetary value will always be what I care for most. But I still wasn't quite convinced about what he was proposing. How do I know you're not playing me? I've seen this sort of thing in movies all the time. There's a catch somewhere, there always is. I went on, shocked at how cynical my speech sounded coming out. And despite my disdain for people of such nature, I was beginning to sound just like them. But I mean, who wouldn't in this scenario? What I've told you is what will be transacted. Nothing comes free and your skepticism is expected. But I know you are a man who loves to live without question. To experience your days without troubles or challenges, do you not? Yes, I said, feeling slightly humiliated. Then what are you waiting for? All you need to do is say the words. The skeleton persisted. Two simple words. A slow exhale left my mouth. My eyes darted between the ceiling and floor as my brain lit up with contemplation. Something told me maybe I should truly listen to him after all. As moronic as it sounds, he knows mountains more than me, doesn't he? I'm gonna die someday anyway, so why not add to my fortune and enjoy it for the next five or so decades that I have left on Earth? If it doesn't harm me, then what do I truly have to lose? I accept. I finally confirmed, looking the skeleton directly in those hollow eyes. Immediately, I heard the click of the lock on the chest. A low creak echoed through the ship as it slowly swung open to reveal its bright, shiny, and mesmerizing contents. Gold, rubies, diamonds, emeralds, you name it. All sorts of precious metals and jewels were in there. It was the most entrancing thing I had ever laid my eyes upon. Far more than the exotic entrance to the cave. I turned back to the skeleton entity to usher him a thank you, only to see that he had disappeared completely, as well as the two halves of the sword. I reached down to begin indulging in the treasure, only to become dizzy as soon as my hands approached the jewels. It was powerfully overwhelming. As if someone force-fed me pills that were specifically designed to make me feel like the world was tipping over like a spilled glass. I tried to keep my balance, hitting these sides of my body against the wood of the ship and seeing that I had nothing to grab onto. Soon enough, my vision became blurry and my brain couldn't take it anymore. I slowly felt the world fade away as everything went black and I lost consciousness for the second time. When I came to, I was back in my bedroom at home. Asking how I got there seemed silly at this point, considering what had transpired so far. There I laid, wiping the grog from my eyes and trying to look around for the chest or a sign of my now increased wealth. 
my concussion also seemed to have been cured, which was a nice bonus. I got up, rummaged through my closet, peeked under my bed and looked through all my drawers. After searching the room and coming up with nothing, I started to immediately assume that I might have been played, slapping myself in the forehead for being so stupidly foolish. But the thing is, I felt different than I did back at the cave. This time, my thought process felt much more clear and concise. Decisions, logic, and basic critical thinking were more on the forefront of my mind. Something in that cave messed with my head like it was a drug. I wasn't my usual self. The skeleton. Maybe the skeleton had did something to me. Manipulated and bent my mental state, causing me to be more open to suggestions. Just as I was about to break down from the stress, a notification popped up on my phone as I laid it next to my bed. It was from my bank. And let me tell you my mood changed swiftly when I read the details. My balance, already being tremendously high from my lottery winnings, had increased by more than four times its original amount. And although in most situations, eyebrows from the bank would have been raised about a huge sudden change in funds like that, that more than likely wouldn't apply in this scenario, due to the way that it got there in the first place. Plus, he said nothing he did directly would affect me. It was all based on what I did. So I did what anyone would do after something like this. I went shopping. And no, I don't mean a crazy spending spree in which I blow all the money. As I've stated before, I don't overspend. But this was an opportunity to treat myself a bit. The first thing that I bought was a brand new flat screen for my living room. I lived alone and didn't have anyone around to worry about. And kids that could potentially end up breaking it. And the lady at the counter who had rung it up almost seemed just as happy as I was. We conversed as a couple of other employees were strapping the thing to a flatbed cart to wheel it out of my car. You made a good choice. I'm sure your family's gonna love watching their favorite movies on that thing. She smiled. Oh, actually, I'm on my own at the moment. I replied without much flair. I'll be honest, she was cute. Not some supermodel, over the top, curvaceous lady with zero blemishes, but definitely attractive. Her hair was up in a ponytail, complemented by her feminine build. A pair of chocolate brown eyes sat below her forehead. Oh, I see. Well, everyone deserves to treat themselves once in a while, don't you think? She punctuates by grabbing a Sharpie marker and writing something down on my receipt. She reached over the counter and handed it to me with the opposite side turned up. I quickly flipped it over to be met with the side of her phone number in a black, bold font. Uh, name's Haley, by the way, she giggled, pointing to her name tag on her shirt. I'm not really supposed to do that, but if you ever want to see me when I'm actually put together, and not in this crappy uniform, uh, maybe you could give me a call. I get home around six. Haley, I thought, and turning to follow the guys rolling the flatbed cart out to my car. In the past, romance had never usually been an important interest for me. I had my fair share of flings, women coming and going here and there. But commitment and a genuine relationship were definitely alien in the way that I lived my life up to this point. I enjoyed my independence and not having to share my assets. So, I thought with all these strange, horrifying, and exciting events happening to me lately, I would try something new. After all, what could truly go wrong? I didn't expect a whole lot to happen, but maybe a couple of dates wouldn't be so bad. I went home that night, set the TV up, and connected it with my cable. The first thing I did was check out the evening news. Wanting to get a sample of just how crisp this thing was outside of the store. I admittedly only watched it for a few short seconds before pulling out my phone in order to call Haley. 8.07 p.m. Read the time on my phone. She would have gotten home about two hours ago. Man, I wanted to call now before it got too late. After I dialed, 
I was met with four rings and then a recorded voicemail message. So I tried one more time, only to get the exact same result. She must be busy, is what ran through my head. All the way up until I overheard the voice of the news reporter coming from my new TV. A tragic accident on highway redacted had claimed the lives of two unfortunate drivers. 34-year-old Robert Kinling and 27-year-old Haley Henderson. The original cause of the collision is currently unknown, but more details will be available as the hours go by. You see, I play that off as a coincidence. That's how I tried to rationalize it. Nothing more than just two people having the same first name. That is until the pictures of the two drivers appeared on the screen. One was the guy who I of course didn't recognize. But when I glanced slightly to the left, there was Haley. The Haley who I had only spoken with just hours ago. She was gone, snatched away from life in the blink of an eye. And there was nothing that I could do about it. I wasn't distraught. I didn't break down in tears or even cry. Sure, I was bummed out. But my main area of thought was one of confusion. Things like this it just happen, I guess. Life is unpredictable. I tossed the receipt that she had written her phone number down into the trash. It felt the same as tossing out an old pair of dead batteries. It's just completely lost its purpose. The rest of my evening, and by extension night, was pretty eerie after hearing of what had happened. I grabbed a beer from the fridge and thought about going back on my boat the next day, only to remember that I no longer had it, and would more than likely have to buy a new one. Great, just what I needed, buying another freaking boat. This skeleton could give me a treasure chest full of jewels, but not my dang boat back. I fell asleep on the couch that night. The empty beer bottle laid resting itself on my chest as the birds chirped outside. That day, I thought I would try and lift my spirits by breaking in my new TV some more, but I only felt pathetically lethargic laying around and surfing through channel after channel, finding nothing to hold my attention. So, this time around, I took a trip to the bar. I figured that maybe some alcohol combined with a bit of watching some morons do dumb things might help me put my brain in a better spot. This place wasn't anything to write home about, and there were honestly better spots to go to in my town. But I didn't care, because this particular bar was what I was personally comfortable with and used to. Men yelled at every shot during their pool game. Fights broke out all the time and the bartenders were always getting on someone's butt about breaking stuff. Everyone here was really funny and enjoyable entertainment for me while I sipped my liquor. However, there was one bartender in particular that I slightly clicked with. Max. I don't know much about him other than his first name and the fact that he really loved to go hunting. He mentioned at least once every single time we delved into conversation. It was irritating, but tolerable. Hey, what's going on, David? He waved politely as I sat down on the stool. A friendly smile spread across his face. I simply gave a nod before responding. Mind if I get a shot of the good bourbon? I don't really feel like talking all that much until I've loosened up a bit. Max raised an eyebrow as he turned to grab a bottle. A long week? He asked as I shot my eyes down toward the counter. I tapped a couple of fingers against the counter, trying to determine how I should reply. My nails are clicking against the wood with a certain rhythm. I ceased the tapping and was met with the sound of silence, as if everyone in the bar had simultaneously decided to play a game of who could be the quietest. I looked up. Wondering what had caused all the commotion and banter to come to such a sudden stop. That was extremely unusual in this place. Yes, a long week it has been. Isn't that correct, David? Said a familiar yet chilling voice in a loud but subtle whisper. I tilted my head up like a crazed pigeon. There, behind the bar, was the skeleton from the cave. This time, standing upright and actually moving. 
I could see most of the glasses and alcohol bottles through the gaps in his bones. Everyone else had seemingly vanished from the bar. It was just him and I. He stared down at me, despite him lacking any flesh, eyebrows, or eyes themselves. I could tell what kind of look he was giving me. It was a glare of intrigue and curiosity, taunting and merciless. What, what are you doing here? I said, getting up off the stool and taking a step back. The skeleton leaned over the bar, placing his bony fingers on the counter as he laughed. He seemed completely unbothered, as if I was being the weird one. I'm simply here to check up on you, David, to see how this deal is treating you. I can see you've already used your increased wealth once so far. Can you leave me alone? I countered. I just want to have a drink. The skeleton tapped his teeth together in irritation. He lifted his skinless index finger and pointed at the stool that I was previously sitting at. Have a seat, David. You forgot. I make the rules and not you. I did as I was told with a reluctant sigh. Once again, the feeling of genuine confusion creeping its way into my psyche. I've got a question, I said, and cupping my hands together and keeping my eyes locked on the skeleton's hollow ribcage. Oh, I know. Although, it would be more fun to hear you say it out loud, he teased. Did Haley have anything to do with the deal? I inquired. Did you just do that to mess with me? What do you truly want from me? The skeleton simply crossed his arms. As I've stated previously, I do nothing that affects the outcomes of your circumstances. Your choices are your own from the point that you receive the fortune. Maybe you will perhaps do something differently. Maybe you will not. But how this all ends is up to you. You'll have to learn and come up with the solution on your own. I simply observe and see your progress. There is a part of me right then and there, banging and clamoring for my lungs to allow me to scream, and shout at him that I already wanted this deal to be over. And before something worse had happened, I could tell this was far from over. It was just the beginning, but I knew I already accepted the terms and he wouldn't allow me to back out. Not now and maybe not ever. I let my gaze fall towards the floor, clenching my hands into fists on the counter, displaying nothing but futile frustration in front of a being who could kill me just by waving his finger. Without thinking, I quickly snapped my head up and shouted passionately, wanting some way to feel any sort of power, as some sort of control. Anything beyond how pathetic I felt, just sitting there helplessly. Let me out! When I registered the area in front of me, the skeleton was gone, replaced by a highly confused and slightly scared Max, looking at me like I was an escaped mental patient. I was starting to wonder if that was actually the case at this point. The rest of the bar all turned their heads, pondering what it was I just screamed like a maniac about. Uh, nobody said you had to stay, man. I'm guessing that you changed your mind about that bourbon. Max asked, reaching for a shot glass. No, no, I pleaded. Give me the dang bourbon. Just got a lot of stuff going on up here. I said, pointing a finger towards my forehead. Max just went on to pour the drink telling me that it was alright and I was fine as long as I didn't keep doing it. I quickly downed the shot. It hit with just the right amount of potency that I needed. I could feel it trickling down my esophagus and into my stomach. I sat around for a bit after, mainly watching the guys at the pool tables primitively argue over trivial things. It was highly amusing. A smile emerged as I felt myself relax. A fight broke out that caused Max and a couple of the bartenders to intervene and break it up. The bar was closing early that night, so I didn't get to stay as long as I had previously hoped. When I went home, I irresponsibly drove myself even after a couple more shots. And although I made it to my residence unscathed, I had one close call with a pickup at an intersection near my home. 
I kicked off my shoes and lazily slumped down out of my couch to turn on the TV, this time opting to watch a game instead of the news. In fact, I stayed off all news outlets, period, even on the internet for the whole night. A nightmare occurred sometime after I dozed off. It was vivid, far too vivid to seem like just an ordinary dream. It was as if someone had placed a Blu-ray disc inside my head and pressed play. I was alone, in the middle of what appeared to be a forest in the later hours of night. About 50 meters in front of me was a clearing in the trees. I ran towards it, not thinking, not processing. I just simply sprinted forward at breakneck speed. The shadows of the bushes and trees engulfed me as I ran. There were no sounds, not even crunching of branches underneath my footsteps. No, it was complete and utter silence. I made it into the clearing and there it sat. The treasure chest from the cave. That small metal lock shining in the night as it stared back at me, inviting me to be opened. I approached it with enthusiasm, rubbing my hands together as if trying to ignite a fire with them. Every step that I took only enhanced my excitement and glee. I reached a hand out towards the chest. My fingers were only inches away from making contact with the lock. I could feel my body shaking with joy, and my mind racing with fantasy after fantasy. And then the skeleton suddenly burst out of the chest, wrapping his bony fingers around my throat, and slowly squeezing my windpipe as if it were a soda can. He stared into my eyes, the structure of his jaw shifting as he attempted to smile. I am what you so desperately want to rid yourself of. You claim you are more than me, yet whenever you have the chance, the opportunity to let me go, you never do. You will never truly banish me. No, I'm stuck with you forever. I am a part of you. I always have been. Starting from childhood, if you're not careful... I'll follow you to death, and even beyond that. And then, with his free hand, the skeleton launched it forward at my gut, puncturing right through my tissue and flesh. I didn't scream, shout, or even make any movements. I just stood there as he tore me open. Look down, you fool, he demanded, retracting his arm from inside me. I did as told and darted my eyes south. Spilled out on the ground below me was not blood, my small intestine, or any gore of any kind. It was dollar bills. Ones, tens, fifties, hundreds, all pouring their way out to my now torn open stomach. Along with jewels, diamonds, rubies, and emeralds alike. All the riches a man could ever want. That's when I awoke in a cold sweat, my breathing heavy like a bull and my eyes frantically darting around the dim lighting of my living room. Nothing but the flat screen television as a source. My hands were shaking. The curtains to my living room window were completely open, making me feel like a sitting duck in my own home. I quickly got up and darted toward the red colored fabric, intending to slam them shut, but not before taking a peek outside. Across the street, there he stood, the skeleton, tipping his pirate hat to me as he gave a slow and taunting wave. I knew that he wouldn't harm me directly or try anything, but the way that he stared at me from across the street, the way that bony hand moved through the air as he waved side to side, it made my stomach churn like butter, not to mention his teeth, looking all the more monstrous due to his lack of gums. It set off every primal alarm bell inside me, yet a part of me now wishes that he would just kill me himself and get it over with. I'm pretty sure the saying goes, there are fates far worse than death, and this, this is one of them. I closed the curtains completely, breaking our eye contact. Although I use the term eye contact loosely, I tried to step away. Go up into my bedroom and throw the covers over myself to cower like a small child. This psychological mind game was far worse than any physical pain or punishment. I would take the boiler room to hell itself over this. 
He said that he wouldn't do anything to harm me directly. I guess he only meant physically. Eventually, I did fall asleep that night. I almost switched to Christianity just to thank the Lord I didn't have another one of those godforsaken nightmares again. But that didn't mean that I slept well. No. It felt like my bed was carried in a raging tornado throughout the night. It was an intense struggle to get myself out of bed. But I did eventually manage. I decided to go back to the bar that morning. Take shots at me all you want. But most people would do something similar. Try to find some way to escape their own mind. Provided they were in my circumstances. When I arrived, there were no cars along the road. No pedestrian cars anyway. Just police cruisers. The yellow crime scene tape was wrapped around the edges of a broken window. Along with the front door that was seemingly forced open. I got out of my car, my mouth hysterically hanging open at what I was seeing. A female officer approached me with her left hand held out in front of her. Whoa, whoa, sir, please. I'm gonna have to ask you to step back. What happened? I insisted. Armed robbery, a couple of suspects attempted to get into the safe in the owner's office. One of the bartenders tried to stop him and was fatally shot. Do you happen to be a family member or relative of a Mr. Max Ivory? I froze at a loss for words. Once again, I didn't cry, break down, or mourn. I was simply confused. This time, more intensely than the last. What could he have possibly done to deserve his grim fate? Sir, the woman snapped her fingers. Are you alright? I broke out of my trance, looking over her shoulder and focusing on the damaged property. Yeah, sorry for interrupting. I'll head out now. For the first time since yesterday, I had checked my phone while walking back to my car and the consequences of my ignorance were there, displayed right in front of me, on one simple notification. Shots fired in armed robbery incident at local bar on Redacted Street. 42-year-old male bartender confirmed dead. Now I know this had something to do with me. It had to. There were too many coincidences. Things weren't adding up. I got back in my car and I drove off. This time with no destination, no place in mind, no set route. I just drove where the roads decided to take me. Highways, back roads, neighborhoods, downtown, I didn't care. I just wanted to get far away from where I was, just for my own sanity. I so desperately wanted to know what it was. What did I do to cause these people to die? Was it because I talked with them? said the wrong thing or didn't use some sort of specific mannerism. There had to be some way to find out, some clue or detail that I had missed. I know the skeleton had the answer, but he would hold it for me for whatever his twisted reasons he had. On my aimless journey, I finally stopped at a cliffside that dropped off into the ocean below. The paved road stopped about 60 feet before the edge. The cliff itself was a few hundred feet in height, the waves crashing and colliding with the pointing rocks below. I got out, grabbed a decent sized stone close to the driver's side door, and gripped it tightly as I walked towards the edge. The ocean seemed so much more vast, far bigger than at sea level. You don't truly realize the full scope until you're way up above it like this. But that wasn't the focus. Not for the time being. No, I stopped my way over to the very edge of the cliff. Only a step or two more and I would dramatically plummet to a horrible yet swift death, being impaled on the rocks at the bottom. I squeezed the stone one final time before pulling back and throwing it off the cliff. My eyes tracked the stone, watching it lose its momentum and plummet into the ocean below. The splash was completely insignificant when it broke the surface of the water. Where are you? I screamed, threatening to burst my own vocal cords with the sheer force of my volume. Show yourself. Come back. I've had enough. I give. I can't take it anymore. I continued to bellow. No response of any kind. No change in scenery, foreign sounds, or the skeleton himself. 
everything in front of me was as normal as can be. He wasn't going to show up. I wondered if he had decided to abandon me, letting me drown in the chaos of my own mind. What was once the psyche of a carefree simpleton who got lucky was now being crushed by the consequences of acting on my blissful ignorance. All I could do was blankly stare at the front window on my way back home. The sky became overcast during the trip. The city felt lifeless from my perspective. That's despite the fact that there were a multitude of cars and pedestrians going on about their business. I laid down on my couch and whipped my phone out to my pocket, beginning to research the story with the bar to find out more details. When I had searched Max's name, however, a GoFundMe donation page had been set up by Max's family, the intention being to use the money to pay for a nice funeral and casket for Max. I didn't know him well, but for once, just for once, I thought that I should do something different with my money. Maybe that was the solution to this problem. Maybe Max, who could be next? I couldn't have another drop of someone else's blood on my hands. It's been a test this entire time. To prove how little I care about my fellow man. Every time I spent the added fortune in a selfish manner, something bad would happen to whoever had accepted it. And I would have to live with the guilt of knowing my selfish actions were causing harm to others. I ended up donating $30,000. It honestly should have been more, way more. But there was something else that I needed to do too. I searched the name Haley Henderson. No GoFundMes or donation pages came up. So instead, I would drop off an anonymous donation. I truly hope that I was correct. I didn't deserve the credit for it anyway. Not even a little bit. In the corner of my eye... I caught the skeleton standing towards the back of my living room, arms crossed and head tilted down at me. So, it seems like you finally learned, David, he announced, sounding somewhat impressed. Screw off, leave me alone, I said putting my phone down on the couch next to me and standing up. Oh, trust me, the skeleton said before slightly levitating off the floor. My time is up. I've served my purpose, so now you may serve yours. I took a step back as he nearly collided with the ceiling. David, he continued, you will not spend a cent more of that fortune on yourself. It will be used to help those who can't help themselves. Otherwise, you will witness the consequences of your greed firsthand. And next time, it won't be others. No, it'll be you. Don't mistake my teaching you a lesson for benevolence. I unclenched my fist, staring off into space as I listened to his grandiose monologue. I, I understand, I said weakly, accepting the prophecy of his statement, knowing that he was right yet again. Everything was me, David, it all was. I've had my eye on you for a very long time. The storm on the ocean, for example... Did you truly think stumbling upon the cave was some random accident? There is a pause of eerie silence for a moment between the two of us. Go, David, he demanded. Fulfill your newfound duties. I'm finished with you, unless, of course, you let your greed drive your choices. Then I will come back. After that, it'll be the last time you see me, or anything, ever again. And it won't be me that puts an end to your life, no. The universe will take care of that. Just as it did with Miss Haley and Mr. Max. And I doubt you would want to leave your way of perishing up to chance. The universe can be quite cruel. Before my response could be made, all the lights in the living room began to violently flicker on and off, only to return back to normal after a few short seconds. And once they did... The skeleton was gone, vanished without a trance, like he was never there. I know what I have to do now.